Hey, it's the Chief Bonnie with Board Games, and what you're about to see is an interview that I did with Dr. Lawrence Pinsky. Um, he worked with another fellow named Schutz, 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 on Midway. He designed uh, or helped design Guadalcanal, Battle of the Bulge, and some other games. Now, what I was trying to do and why I'm doing this pre-intro is that uh, he agreed to do a back and forth visual interview, uh, but not live. So I was recording it and then gonna, and I've saved it over for editing purposes and whatnot, but we couldn't get his camera to work uh, with my system. But I did not want to lose the chance. So what you will see is just me and audio from Dr. Pinsky, or when the interview concluded, uh, he said I can call him Larry. So Larry. Um, so you're going to see that video right now. Okay, I've got Dr. Lawrence Pinsky joining me. I believe you're in Houston right now. Is that correct, sir? Yes, it is. Excellent, excellent. Chief of the Physics Department for the University of Houston. Do I have that correct? Well, actually, for thirteen, for eighteen years, I was served as a uh, the department chair, and I oh. stepped down in twenty thirteen. But Got I'm it. still a distinguished full professor there. Beautiful, beautiful. And I know after doing my interviews with uh, Tom Shaw, and we're going to get into that in a little bit, but he talked about how. I believe during your summer breaks from Carnegie Mellon, you were actually coming and helping design at Avalon Hill. Is that correct? Yeah, as a matter of fact, it started before I went to Carnegie Mellon. Uh, it was Carnegie Tech back in those days. Huh. Now, I, was, I graduated from the first graduating class, so they had the option to call it Carnegie Mellon. Beautiful. Now, did you start, because I'd had some people tell me that they thought you'd started designing games actually while you were still in high school. So were you still in high school when you started? Yes, uh, that's true. I had this uh, old Buick 55 Buick and used to drive up to Baltimore because we were living in the outskirts of Washington and Maryland at the time. Now I got um, involved uh, when one of my uh, high school colleagues showed me the Tactics 2 game and it got hooked pretty fast. And uh, we got in together in the car and drove up there and, and saw Tom Shaw. And then Midway was uh, a game that was at that point, uh, Lindsay Schutz was, uh, you know, working on the, the, the background. So we got to play that before it was published. Beautiful. And I was going to ask you, uh, Lindsay, Lindsay's last name is pronounced Schutz. That's the way I pronounced it. Okay. I think you're right. I looked at it and uh, when I'd read Tom's book, I wasn't sure on the exact pronunciation, um, but uh, I know he was, um, you're listed as, I believe, both co-designers, or was he listed as a developer and you're a designer on Midway? I don't remember this, the niceties. Sure. Yeah. That was my game. Guadalcanal was your game, and I know Battle of the Bulge as well, but I do not have a copy of that. Yeah, I have uh, copies of Battle of the Bulge. I've got a lot of copies of the old games that are all stacked away. We downsized our house uh, two years ago, and uh, so I still got them in boxes in the garage somewhere. Um, yeah. um, now I, we'll come. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, uh, Guadalcanal was really a challenge to make exciting because it you know, was sort of the Marines stuck on the beach and the Japanese infiltrating through the jungles. But uh, we did the best we could. It was uh, you know, an early attempt. Well, and then you had um, a very nice, oh, I'm going to forget the major's name, but I know it was kind of post, but, um, oh, it's Donald Dixon or Colonel. Sorry, I down I downranked him there. I know Tom went and met with him, and, and then he added to the production of the game. You've got his beautiful uh, Leatherneck Illustrated was part of the game in there as well. Um which was a big proponent. Really what brought me into wargaming was when I was 13 and I was reading World War II spoke to me uh, for some reason. I don't know why there's not, not a lot of military history in my family, but it was the idea that I could get into almost like crawling inside of a book with a game. Is that how do how do games relate or how do you relate with games? Is it more just game or is it history and game? 
Oh, it's definitely history. As a matter of fact, one of the design requirements I imposed on myself is that the game had to be able to reasonably uh, mimic reality. You know, okay. in other words, uh, you know, if the, you could not realistically reproduce the actual uh, combat situations, uh, then the game was flawed. You know, and so it was definitely, uh, you know, love of history. And, and I, when I was in high school, I also had, a, but I was, you know, a little bit broader. I mean, uh, Civil War really uh, stuck out as well as an interest, as well as World War II. And then, of yeah. course, the guys at SPI went back and did just about every combat situation that existed as a simulation. You bet. You bet. Now, you're in this perfect time. You're really at the forefront of when the history and game version is, you know, making its way. You're you're literally at the forefront of that. I know there was miniatures all the way back to Napoleon where they would they would war, war game, yeah. right? They would war game through battles. But as uh, the idea of it as a commercial endeavor, you know, that was where Avalon Hill and Charles Roberts was really bringing it in, and then. You jump in, and Tom, when I talked to Tom in preparation for the show I did with him, he just talked about how brilliant you were as a young man. He knew that you had had aspirations maybe even toward being an astronaut. And, and I don't know if he was guessing or you – I know you've worked with NASA. Can you – do you want to touch on any of that at all? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, the thing is I had wanted to be an astronaut, and actually I was an astronaut candidate. Mm. Uh, what has got into the finalist group? Uh, it was the same group with Sally Ride. Oh, but then uh, it turns out that uh, my uh, um, blood work was just, you know, a high blood sugar situation, and uh, so I don't know whether they would have selected me, but I got blackballed by the the medical types. Mm. But I am still connected to NASA doing radiation uh, dosimetry work and have been for decades now. I saw that a lot of work even with like uh, using that radiation to study asteroids and things of that nature. Well, that was just one uh, project <laughs> we got involved in. Forgive me. You know, that's uh, I know you are literally the doctor. I know you're world renowned for your, your research and work there as well. Well, I wouldn't go that far, but uh, we have had a lot of contacts at NASA and a lot of work with them, and we're still still involved. Beautiful. Now, I wanted to dial back uh, when I was uh, working on my interview or my kind of my documentary interview with Tom. He'd sent me some of the ads that he'd written, and I uh, talked to him and told him that I was going to be uh, doing this interview with you, and he pointed out that one of the ads he sent me, he said, you were seated in this picture and your brother is standing. And I don't know if you can see that good enough. Are you able to kind of see this or do you remember this ad? Uh, I didn't get to see the ads. I mean, oh. he, okay. So. And he said, you're, I believe you, he said, I couldn't tell quite which he said you were seated and your brother was standing. And I thought maybe that person standing with the red Avalon Hill shirt was your brother or you? No, that looks like Lindsay. Okay, that's so that's Lindsay shoots. And then is maybe the fellow with his hand on his chin? I don't want to. He no. just told me to show this to you. Um, I don't know if I can. <laughs> believe it or not, I think if I let, if I was in that picture, it had to be the guy seated down at the front on the right hand, lower right hand side. Got it. Okay. And he just, he'd mentioned that to me saying, Hey, actually in one, in that one ad, um, he couldn't remember your brother's name, but he said he thought you were seated and your brother was standing. So, but I don't know. What is your brother's name? Just so I know if I can. Well, I have several brothers. I have two oh. of them, Michael and Gordon. And I, uh, I don't, I did, neither one of them really was very enthusiastic about the war games. Got it. So. Got it. All right, so to go back in time now again, so you're even in high school, you've driven down, you've met with Tom Shaw. Um, were you doing early on some play testing with them on the games before you yeah, got into design work? 
Yeah, you know, like I said, uh, we play tested Midway. Okay. Yeah, because yeah. we were doing the counters that Tom made up, you know, to, in the shop there. And so we got involved in that and uh, started thinking about designing our own games. And that's where, you know, they basically wound up hiring me for the summers, for the first couple of summers in college. And we did Blitzkrieg. That was a, an interesting story behind Blitzkrieg. They wanted to do a Tactics 2 replacement with the hexagons instead of the squares, you know, to move on. Right. And um, we had started with the Gettysburg uh, redo, you know, from the, the original Gettysburg game had the elongated, you know, um, counters, rectangular counters. To show the, you know, like the, the units moving in, uh, in an attack formation. And so they wanted to go away from that old Gettysburg game to one with uh, hex cells in it. And so <clears throat> we worked on, on that, you know, as for playtesting. But Blitzkrieg came along as, as a replacement for tactics. And Tom is a, a better at... Uh, baseball fan, as uh, you may have discerned from talking to him. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. And so um, that's what he came up with, the great Kofax Desert, because it's sandy. I saw that. Yeah. And I wanted to name uh, one of the features. I was a San Francisco Giants fan at the time. And uh, I wanted to name one after Juan Marichal, if he was going to go to Kofax. And, and then uh, he, the Lake Pinsky business was something that he entirely did at the very last moment. So I didn't see that till the game was in production. Got it. You know, we, we got actually criticized for the uh, some of the rules changes and and the structure of the uh, orders of battle for this fictional situation. Hmm. But I based it on uh, army field manuals. They uh, back in those days, there was a field manual for the intelligence people. And they had this uh, fictitious uh, enemy called Aggressor. And they had orders of battle and, uh, you know, T.O. and E, table of equipment, et cetera. And, that, you know, it was for the in intelligence guys to get involved in, in war games with, you know, in training situations. And they, they had this uh, foreign, fictitious foreign power that was, uh, you know, sort of almost World War II level. You know, mm -hmm. armament who wasn't didn't anticipate the nuclear era very well. But at any rate, that was a game that I designed from scratch. Mm. Excellent. Now I know from Tom's book. Well, let's see. He talks first. He he has an area uh, where he mentions um, that. Uh, that he has you as an undergraduate student at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh, aiming to be an astronaut. And he talks about how, um, oh, he has a mix amidst the growing stack. So he describes that you guys would basically play test in like a warehouse area where they had boxes and boxes of what he calls the six packs. And you would even, would you even use these to kind of make the table for the play testing? Oh yeah. Okay. I I still have some of the sheets, the, the blank hex sheets, uh -huh. rolled up in tubes, you know, uh -huh. and uh, and the, he had the blank uh, punched out um, square counter sheets that we would, uh, uh, you know, hand label. Got it. Now, did he try to rope you into batting practice? He makes jokes about how everybody had to kind of come in and, and, and do some baseball type stuff. Did you get into that with him at all? Well, we, we went out and played catch one or two, two times, yeah. But no, he was definitely a big, uh, big time uh, Orioles fan. Yes. Brooks Robinson. Now, let's see. Um, he also mentions later on, he does like a uh, an Avalon Hill wrap up. But he says, you did a lot of your research for some of your game designs at the Library of Congress, actually in D.C., and that for you, I guess, where I don't know if you were living in the, he says you were a D.C. resident. Well, we were living in Maryland, just outside of D.C. at the time. 
Yeah, as a, as a matter of fact, I still actually uh, think in, in some of those tubes, I have the large ops uh, maps from uh, Hitler's headquarters. Mm. Because all those uh, documents were, you know, captured at the end of the war and put into the Library of Congress. And in those days, you could go in and walk in the front door and, you know, pull out the, these huge maps of the Eastern Front and... Uh, in Russia that was being kept by the actual German uh, high command. Wow. And and you could just, I mean, you could just sit down and order it and sit down at the desk and they'd bring it to you. And you could say, okay, I want a photocopy of this. And they were really cheap. Mm. I mean, not a big deal. It's, it's, it's in a huge role. That's awesome. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah still available in the, uh, the Library of Congress. Beautiful. Now, to move back towards the, the future, and I know as busy as you are and have been, um, did you stay in contact uh, and continue gaming, or did it kind of fade in and out for you? Well, it, it more or less faded out because I got, you know, academically involved, and, uh, and I didn't have, uh, you know, any, I, I wasn't around people that wanted to play the games. Sure. While I was an undergraduate, it was at the early days of computerizing things. And back in then, we were using Fortran and decks of cards, of punch cards. And so um, I started on a project while I was probably a senior um, to use it as a tool to uh, uh, keep track of things. You know, in other words, a unit that you could have a unit with a strength that varied with the experience of the unit and the, its its record, et cetera. Uh, but the game was still still designed to be something that supported the game uh, being played on a you know with the uh, counters on the board. Um, the problem was in those days I got one run a day, you know, for, for the card deck. Right. And, um, we didn't have the speed of the computers we're talking about now or the uh, memory capability. Sure. So, so uh, you know, then my interest, I, well, number one, I got, I wound up being drafted. Really? Yeah. It's a, that's a long story. We don't need to go into the details. Okay. Uh, uh, that was after I had gone to graduate school for a year and I had, uh, uh, wound up getting drafted because my draft number well, I was a first the first class that didn't have uh, student deferments for mm. graduate school and so I <laughs> turns out I wound up applying for a direct commission uh, based upon my at that point I was qualified for a master's degree in physics and so I got a direct commission and I was a very lucky guy the, the details are probably not very interesting, but after being in basic training as a, as a draftee, I got commissioned right out of basic training and w went to Corps of Engineers basic. And uh, while I was there, it turns out the Army had a problem in Vietnam at that time. You're talking about 1969. Yeah. And then as most of the officers were ROTC officers with the two-year two obligation, and they would refuse to promote faster than once a year, which when you talk about it to these days, people don't realize how fast officer promotions were made. And the problem was they were no captains. Hmm. Bringing guys in as a second lieutenant for a year, promoting them to first lieutenant, and then they got out. So you had, uh, I don't know if you remember the Lieutenant Cali uh, uh, mess that occurred when he was a company commander. Yeah, was that it? Well, was that uh, my lay? Yes. Yes. Yeah, but the point was, as a lieutenant, he was a company commander. He didn't have experience. And so, he, in the Army's inimitable way, they came up with a program called the Volunteer Indefinite, which really sounded <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so I told them, no, I didn't want to agree to stay in for a third year because I wanted to get it over with. And um, then uh, they came up with this program. If you volunteered to stay in for a third year so you could be a captain, you could call your own shots for the first two years. Hmm. And uh, uh, since I was doing my thesis re research at that time, 
on cosmic ray physics, astrophysics. Uh, they had an opening. NASA had sort of requisitioned some of the people in this program, and I got selected. Wow. So instead of going to Vietnam, I went to uh, to Houston, and uh, uh, I got there between Apollo 11 and Apollo 12, and I worked the Apollo program mm -hmm. doing dosimetry for the astronauts on the Apollo missions, starting with Apollo uh, 12. And I wound up defending my PhD thesis, which was based upon my NASA research uh, and getting out of the Army in the same month as a captain. But by that time, I was, in, I was married and, uh, you know, involved in doing stuff related to the research. And so I, I worked off and on on a war in the Pacific. As a matter of fact, Avalon Hill had trademarked the name uh, of uh, Rising Sun. Hmm. And my version of Rising Sun was, was oh, well over uh, complex. I mean, because you have to try and capture, you know, the combat, which takes place in minutes. You know, it was at hours with a, a war that lasted for four years. Right. So how did you lose the detail? Like Midway, for example, with the aircraft attacking it. How could you put that into something that a single game that had a, a map? I tried my darndest to do that and uh, eventually uh, gave up. Mm. So I think The Rising Sun was published as a, another game entirely unrelated to what I had done. I remember, yeah, they had a title on it that was tied in with their, oh, what did they call it? The, was it their Third Reich series, Vance Third mm. Reich? And then they came up with The Rising Sun for the Pacific side. Now, I'm curious. I was a medic in a light infantry unit. I was in the army reserve. Now I went to basic at Leonard Wood, which is where they have all their combat engineers. Did you go to Leonard Wood or did they have it somewhere else for the engineer? No, the the, the uh, basic officers engineer basic was at, uh, uh, in just south of Washington, you know, at, uh, Oh gosh, the name of the, the Ford right there. Just across. Sure. The uh, oh, I Belvoir. Okay. Yeah, that, that's what they, the officers program. And, and as a matter of fact, I'll not tell you an anecdote. It's not related to gaming, but uh, I, uh, you know, was in basic training in the fall. And I knew by the, you know, the end of the fall, I was going to Houston. And, and I, you know, of course, was, I bought a car, so I had no money. <laughs> and, and I was going to have to drive down to Houston. My family was in the Northeast in Washington and Boston areas for Christmas. And this was just before Thanksgiving and uh, that I would have to go and I wouldn't have been able to come back for the holidays. So they came into a, and to one of our classes and said, listen, if you want to take courses, advanced courses, now's the time to do it. You know, tell us you can apply for these various courses. Um, and, um, and so uh, basically, I looked around for something that would keep me there just until Christmas so I could take leave and, and be, then go down to Houston. And there was a course in atomic demolitions. And so I applied, I applied for that. And given the fact that I had a nuclear physics background, they jumped at grabbing me. And when they were talking about these tritium bottles in the, in the uh, warheads, you know, uh, actually, you know, the, the they were, were planning to use them as a uh, uh, physical barrier. That is, the, the, there was a hole drilled in the middle of the runway at Rhein-Main Airport in Germany that was 800 feet deep. And if the bad guys had come over the hole, you know, they, they could order an explosion, which would cause a crater that would make the airport unusable as a, an airport if it was captured. I mean, that's an example of what they were doing with atomic demolitions. Huh. And of course, um, I never used it. But again, I was the only one who backed up when they started talking about the tritium bottles and there was all the Marines and other guys that stick their nose over there because I was the only one who understood this was radio. <laughs> yeah, yeah, see, all I would have known was I would have known enough to watch you 
and that I would have just mirrored whatever you were doing. <laughs> I'll go with this guy over here. Uh, now that's see that's now that's a real nice parallel when uh, with with Tom Tom Shaw. He's drafted during Korea, and he ends up going to Redstone Arsenal and then the White Sands Proving Grounds. And he was a he, he rocket repair, which he said, which was crazy because he says these things they fire them once and then they're gone. There's nothing to repair. But and then he ends up writing for the Post paper and of course playing baseball. Uh, semi-pro baseball when he was down at uh, White Sands uh, Proving Ground. So that's an interesting tie-in there as well. I did yeah. not know we were drafted. Yeah, well, I, it's funny, you know, because I got to notice when I was in graduate school. And uh, basically at that point in time, if you could just ask for a, def a deferment of the date up to one year and they would grant it. The, the clerk in the draft office had the right to do that. You couldn't avoid it. But the other rule was there was only one request. You know, you could come on with the second request and say, you know, regardless of how much. You, and so the the chairman of the department, when I got the re, the uh, draft notice, um, the reason I <clears throat> I was one of the few was going back to the original story, is when I was a senior, I investigated the Navy's, uh, you know, uh, officer candidate school that they run out of Newport. And um, to consider going into the Navy for three years and then coming back and going to graduate school. Hmm. And so uh, they brought me in and did all the testing and everything. And then I got this call from Rick over, Admiral Rick over. Here's a nuclear physics undergraduate, or, you know, graduate school. And uh, the, uh, at any rate, he, you had to commit to five years instead of three to go into the nuclear program. I told him I wasn't interested in staying in five years. I wanted to get back to graduate school. So they, they said, well, if that's your attitude, we don't want you. And so they kindly forwarded my successful physical and stuff like that to the draft board. Hmm. While all the other colleagues I had in graduate school were being ordered to report for physicals, I got odd draft notice. Because I was already 4A qualified, 1A qualified, I guess it was. And at any rate, uh, the chairman of the department asked for, a you know, sent the deferment in to complete the semester. And he could have said do it for a year, but so I was uh, pegged to go at the end of the uh, middle of June. And I showed up at the draft board, but we had moved from Maryland where we lived and up to the Boston area. And so I just did what the reporting paper said. And I showed up the day they were going to draft me. And she said, oh, we can't possibly draft you for a month unless you volunteer to be drafted. <laughs> and I, so I said, OK, I'll volunteer to be drafted to get out sooner. So I get out you know, in time to go back to school. Right. That was before we started the process to apply for the direct commission, et cetera. Hmm. So I wound up going through basic training in, in Columbia, South Carolina, Fort Jackson. No. Main Fort Jackson. But um, uh, then again, uh, the commissioning permission came down just a couple of weeks before the end of my tenure as a basic trainee and they decided the base commander decided to leave me in basic training till the end. And, um, they pin the gold bar on my collar, uh, just as they shipped me up to Fort Belvoir to go through the officer's basic course at that point in time. Wow. That's an amazing story in and of itself. Yeah. Well, I was very lucky. Everything fell together just right. Right. Now to step back, um, is what other memories, what was like the feel of Avalon Hill when you were there? I mean, is there anything, you know, even texture wise or just feel, or what was the feel of Avalon Hill back in that era? Well, it was, you know, like it, you described it, it was in a warehouse. I mean, and we were in amongst all the boxes and playing and, uh, there was other guys that had come in to, to be uh, testers, et cetera, you know, game testers. 
as well as doing the design and you know and and we enjoyed the time you know we had playing games and modifying rules and uh, uh, trying to come up with something that was uh, exciting and then of course looking over the shoulder of tom while he was doing the graphic arts he did all the graphic art stuff hmm. but it was yeah. uh, I just a I picture just i mean it, to me it's well so as a kid one reason i even wanted to do these interviews uh with uh folks that had worked for designed for avalon hill was even as a, a kid playing the games you know, I always saw that uh, Baltimore address, Harford Avenue, and I, and it was funny. I pictured, um, I pictured more of what you experienced, which I now know from Tom. Later, as the years go by, it it kind of changed a little bit. But I mean, the idea that you were able to, so you just drove down and and kind of knocked on the door and were ushered in. Yeah, basically. What we did is we just got in the I got in the car and a couple of the guys I played with, uh, you know, said, "Hey, let's let's go take a look and see what these guys are doing." And we were surprised that they were they were so receptive to allowing us in the front door, so to speak. With your core group that you found was, I know you already said your brothers weren't so much into the war game side of it, but was it neighbor kids or was it kids from school? Kids from school, you know, basically in the high school. And uh, you're right, it was not uh, a large fraction of the population that was interested. But usually they were motivated by the same interest in the history. And that was an important thing. It wasn't just an abstract way to kill time, you know, right. in the game or, or, you know, shoots and ladders or something like that, you know. And so, um, yeah, the, there was a core group that, that, uh, made it possible I, I remember another anecdote is uh actually sat down at home on a drafting table and actually drew my own board of hexagons that that uh, i think impressed tom quite a bit you know just to be able to do that sure and i know tom had worked out or i don't want to give it all to tom i'm sure it was with with other designers stuff that the hexagons then allowed for you to actually organize movement equally in all or directions right yeah, radio yeah and right. also well the, the other thing too is there's actually uh uh you know in terms of piling on a, a attack on a defending position depending upon you know the 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 uh, line of defense along the line, if it went the con along the histogram, the uh, hexagon, uh, you could only get two squares close enough. Whereas if it was running at a zigzag, you could get three and salient points, which was an interesting um, factor in the movement using hexagons that you had to take into account when you designed it. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, I um, want. Yeah, uh, with your time, Doctor, and I know I appreciate it graciously for you coming on. I know we've been emailing back and forth. Is there is there anything else you wanted to add in while we're here, or anything? Uh, oh, yeah, I, did. I was going to say I did uh, sort of contact Dunnigan ah, and, and got involved with him every time I got into New York. I go down and see those guys, and I did a little game designing for them. One that I designed and never made it out the door was Okinawa. Really? It's a, well, there's not much of a you know uh, question as to what was going to happen, and the the question is just inflicting maximum maximum casualties, which was not a very interactive game. But he had accept, ex suggested I have a crack at it, and I worked with them on a number of other games too. Now, he's quite the strong personality. I haven't met him personally, but he does Strategy Page, and then he has a podcast called Strategy Talk that I listen to. And I know his, his co-host. Oh, he, he's a military historian par excellence. And, you know I mean? He, he lectures at the War College, too. Yes. And he did back in those days as well. Yeah, and I know he's got some fabulous contacts really all over the world. 
Yeah. No, so, he's an impressive guy as far as simulations are concerned. Yeah, he's awesome. And he loves his cigars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, again, thank you. Thank you, uh, doctor, for coming on the show. I know your time is valuable. Um, I, I love, me personally, the history of Avalon Hill and really getting back to these, these early days. The idea that you know, you're in high school and you're able to drive down with some buddies because you're a fan of the game and you're ushered in and you're able to, to get in there and, and uh, play test some things right there in their warehouse. To me, as soon as I started to, to read some of that in Tom's book and then talk with Tom about it, that's when I started to, you know, research you and where, where you were at. And so I want to thank you a lot for, for giving your time to come on the show. I know we had the, uh, we couldn't get the video to work, but uh, I, just having you on uh, via voice is, is, is quite a pleasure. Well, thank you very much. Oh, you're more than welcome. Uh, it was fun reminiscing. It's been yeah. a while. We thought about those times. I know, and uh, and then your your military stories. That's just that uh, was like a beautiful. I mean, that, that's awesome. I I had no idea on that. So thank you for sharing all that as well. Um, uh, go ahead and stay on for me. I'm going to go ahead and end the broadcast here. It won't break our connection. It just stops the actual recording. All right, I wanted to pop back in after we wrapped up. That was awesome. I loved it. Even though I had the audio visual glitch, we couldn't get the visual to work. And all you see is my mug a lot. I just found that interview to be awesome. Really enjoyable for me. Hopefully you enjoyed it as well. The whole army thing. Again, we have somebody getting drafted who's a genius. Can you imagine you're going through basic training as an enlisted person? Maybe because of his degree, he got a specialist rank or maybe an E3. And at graduation, you're getting pinned with second lieutenant bars and then boom, we're gonna send you off to officer's basic school. And then turning down an admiral in the Navy, probably a nuclear physics admiral saying, you know, I don't wanna give you five, three. No, it's five, bye. <laughs> I love it. There's so much unsaid in that and so much imparted with that knowledge. Um, uh, again, you can just see, you can hear the genius along with all the NASA stuff. But enough of that. Hopefully you guys again enjoyed this and don't forget, feed the niche. See you guys. Bye.